the Jewish channels we can review. Israel has a new government, and some of the members are protesting at the Western Wall, while a familiar face is awarded here at home. It's the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Israel's new government is ready to be sworn in. More than seven weeks after the surprising election results of January 22nd, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is set to remain Prime Minister in a coalition that noticeably excludes ultra Orthodox parties and is quite unlikely to aggressively pursue a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's also a coalition that at least theoretically includes a broad political diversity. Retaining the Prime Minister post, the Foreign Ministry and Defense is Netanyahu's joint party Likud Beitenu. Netanyahu himself will actually also serve as Foreign Minister for a period, while the man who held the post until last year, Avigdor Lieberman, works to fend off criminal allegations. Another combination of parties will hold the second tier of the new government, though this combination would seem to be somewhat more surprising. The presumed somewhat liberal former TV news anchor Yair Lapid and the man largely seen as representing the settler movement, Naftali Bennett, made a deal recently regarding what kinds of policies they'll pursue. Lapid appears to have given up aggressive pursuit of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in exchange for getting a significant amount of ultra-Orthodox Jews drafted into the military. That's the main sticking point that has made coalition talks so difficult, but the creation of this coalition means that this is is the first time since the administration of former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin nearly 20 years ago that the ultra-Orthodox will not be part of a governing coalition. Lapid will also be finance minister, and the second smallest party entering the coalition, Sipi Livni's Hatznua party, will get the justice ministry and the portfolio for managing negotiations with the Palestinians. But with the Lapid-Bennett deal and a coalition leader in Netanyahu's Likud Beitenu party that has only become more right-wing in the election process, there isn't much Livni is expected to be able to do on that Israeli-Palestinian peace process. For all of these reasons, the story of this coming Israeli government is less about what it will do in the coming years than the jostling for position we'll see in that time. Lapid has made it clear he has his eyes on the prime minister job, and the political momentum today is certainly more in his favor than it is for Netanyahu, who lost quite a lot of support between the election of 2009 and the one held in January. At the same time, Bennett and other further-right politicians, including those within Netanyahu's own party, have the position in their sights. Meanwhile, Livni will likely try to make peace with the Palestinians a political agenda item for the next elections, since she'll be able to get very little agreement from this coalition. But the most important action might be taking place entirely outside the government, among the groups that were left out, the ultra-Orthodox parties. How those groups take this electoral and political loss, and whatever changes in the military draft and other regulations are to come, is going to go a long way to determining the results of the next election. If the ultra-Orthodox become invigorated by this loss, they could work to engineer voter turnout in the next election that would not only overturn any reforms undertaken in the coming months and years, but they could push even further to solidify the government programs that benefit the ultra-Orthodox. And if the ultra-Orthodox decide to turn away from politics, a mass of people losing their special benefits and privileges could offer some surprising twists for those trying to govern them. But all indications are that this new government will be installed in time for President Barack Obama's visit to Israel and Palestine that begins next week. And the practical impact of these coalition talks will be already available to be seen in that visit, as Netanyahu, now both Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, with one of his deputies as Defense Minister, will host talks with the President. But one symbol of change in the government that many not only in Israel but in Jewish communities around the globe have sought is empowering women in public and religious life in Israel. The record 27 women elected to the Knesset in January represent some of that change, and three of those female members of Knesset joined in what has become the most visible symbol of women's advocacy in Israel, the prayer services at the Western Wall hosted by the group Women of the Wall. On Tuesday, three female Knesset members openly wore prayer shawls or talises during a prayer service at the Western Wall. They were Stav Shafir of the Labor Party and Michal Rosen and Tamir Zandberg of the Meretz Party. As opposed to many of the more than 100 women at the prayer service other than them, these Knesset members wore their prayer shawls openly at the holy site. Most others wore theirs under clothing or kept them hidden while directly in front of the Western Wall to avoid arrest. 
A report from Ben Sales of JTA cited an interview with the spokesperson of the Western Wall Police, Mickey Rosenfeld, saying that it was specifically due to the presence of those Knesset members that no arrests were made. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., several Jewish women were being honored for their status as, quote, troublemakers. The co-host of TJC's show, The Salon, Rachel Sklar, was honored for her work in promoting visibility, access, and opportunity for women at the luncheon of the Jewish Women's Archives, alongside two other women, Rachel cohen Garrell and Belle Kaufman. Meredith Gansman reports. It's been said that well-behaved women rarely make history, so sometimes you have to honor the troublemakers who do. At the Jewish Women's Archive Making Trouble, Making History Luncheon, it was good to be bad for these three honorees. It's very cool these days to, pardon my language, but to quote unquote, kick some ass. To me, feminists are like superheroes. All my life, I've had to do something that I had to do. Honoree Rachel Sklar is familiar to TJC viewers as a co-host of The Salon. She was being honored for her work empowering women through organizations she's founded like Change the Ratio and The List, which advocates for women in male-dominated fields like the tech industry. She's also on the launch team for Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg's new memoir, Lean In. Sklar said that experience is a major driver of success. You know, you have that confidence and that assurance, and, and I guess every year you care a little bit less, and you have a little bit less patience, and I think that does help. However, according to Sklar, there is also a darker side to fighting to make a difference. The, the dark side comes in the costs, the personal costs, the quiet costs that come every time you don't toe the line, every time you speak out, every time when people are pushing at you, that you push back. Fellow honoree Belle Kaufman has 101 years of experience. The granddaughter of famous Yiddish author Shalom Aleichem, writing was in her blood. Her provocative novel, Up the Down Staircase, took readers inside New York City's public high school classrooms and spurred education reform across the country. Looking way back, I never knew I was making history. Looking way back, I was as insecure as most young women. The third honoree, Rachel Cohen Gerald, co founder of the Nexus Global Youth Summit, a network of international young philanthropists, acknowledged the troublemakers that came before laying the path. I couldn't be in any of the rooms that I'm in, stirring up any of the trouble that I do, if there weren't feminists before me to knock down those doors. I'm standing on your shoulders, and I'm inspiring a generation to do the same. Following in these women's footsteps, nice Jewish girls will grow into women who make even more change and hopefully more trouble. For the Jewish Channel, I'm Meredith Gansman. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, should you have children? It's a question being asked not only by individual families, but also by policymakers and pundits these days. They tend to focus on one surprising fact. Parents, according to studies, are generally less happy than those who are not parents. Making the opposing argument is Rabbi Simcha Weinstein in a new book, The Case for Children. He stopped by TJC Studios for an interview, and here are the highlights. So obviously, a book, The Case for Children, you know, the, the assumption is there's a case against children. So what's the case against children that we see being made these days? Well, it's interesting because never before in human history have uh, birth rates fallen so far, so fast, and in so many places. And the case is, at, uh, I guess, at first glance, a good one and a strong one. And I could probably write that book, too. Uh, you know, children are the uh, surest way to send your carbon footprint soaring. Uh, they are very, very expensive. And many studies show they make you less happy. And that's the most interesting thing, is that, um, is that people often say they want to have children uh, as part of a sense of fulfillment, as part of a sense of, uh, of, of, of continuing their lives in a way that they feel will make them happy. But then studies show consistently that parents are less happy than non-parents. Right. I mean, I, I, I would answer that by, uh, I guess, uh, firstly asking the question, how does one define happiness? Uh, you know, this country was founded on the pursuit of happiness and not the pursuit of comfort. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you go to Dwayne Reed, uh, you know, you can always get the uh, Hershey bars and the National Enquirer 
on the way out. You know, I think short term we seek comfort, but I think long term we seek happiness and we seek meaning. And while children are tiring, draining, I can tell you that firsthand, it's almost like running a marathon. You know, there's a difference between being a participant and a spectator. And to run a marathon, it takes work, it takes discipline. But can you imagine the sensation when you were cross the finishing line? So it's, it's meaning, and I think meaning is perhaps the true definition of happiness. I've got two kids who are, who are young, both under four years old. Uh, when, when does it be, you know, and, and if people ask me if I'm happier, I would, pro I would probably say yes, but on average we know that people would say no. Um, wh at what point do, does the fulfillment, does the sense of meaning, does that come in? Uh, it's, it's a work in, in, in progress, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, um, my kids do fine just by themselves, and uh, ultimately I don't do homework with my kids because it's good for my kids. I do homework with my kids because it's good for me. I need that sense of discipline. I need that sense of structure. There's an empirical basis for saying children don't make people happier. What's your, do you have an empirical basis for the meaning fulfillment argument? I mean, firstly, studies show that most couples um, do um, admit to wanting to have children. So the question is not, I guess, if, the question is when. And the longer we wait, the more reasons there are for waiting. And I'll give you, I guess, uh, perhaps there are many uh, empirical uh, um, answers that I cite in the book. Just one answer. Um, you know how much it costs to raise a child zero to 16 according to the Department of Agriculture? I'm not sure why they're the ones that uh, decide this. It's about $250,000. Now, if you factor in a loss of earnings and college tuition, zero to 21 is around a million dollars. Now, if you factor in yeshiva tuition, it's about $10 million. Now, the answer I would give is that we don't live, you know, all at once. We live day to day. Children really are cheaper by the dozen. Uh, you know, I recycle everything with my kids and I recycle things um, with, my, uh, with my friends. And it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a beautiful way to recycle things. And uh, there is a sense of economies of scale. The more you have, the cheaper um, they become. But I would throw the price tag back at you. I would say, let's play devil's advocate. If it costs a million dollars to raise a child, we have to look at children as assets and not liabilities. I have an asset now that's worth a million dollars. Let me ask you, you have two children. Would you sell them for two million? I, I would not sell my children. Two billion? Yes, no. So there's an empirical answer. You have an asset that's worth two million dollars. You can see the full interview with Simcha Weinstein under the weekly news category on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the On Demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.